Trajan Shaka Langdon, born May 13th, 1976. As of 2012, if you were a fan of the San Antonio Spurs, Brooklyn Nets, or even New Orleans Pelicans, you might just go to a game and see a light-skinned fellow walking the premises in a suit and think to yourself simply, who is the guy in a suit watching attentively? Or who's the guy with official game stats of the first half sitting next to me looking like he's not really enjoying the game? The point is, most times in that atmosphere, you probably wouldn't recognize Mr. Langdon as a guy that was once the most talked about thing in college basketball, playing for the most talked about team. Before JJ Redick, the sharpshooting dookie of all dookies, there was this guy. Before Duke actually started recruiting the flashy guys with tattoos, cornrows, obvious one and dones, they seemed to have a sweet spot for guys like today's feature, and he fit right into the mold. In fact, for a long time, he was the face of what it meant to play for Duke, whether you like it or not. He's had a great college career and was even selected 11th in the NBA draft, ahead of Meta World Peace, Manu Ginobili, Corey Maggetti, and even Andre Karolinko. He would wound up averaging just 14 minutes a game over his three-year league stint, and here's why. It's your boy JC, StunnerGrow3.com. Ash, get it, man. Stunt number one, Dookie Dookie. Hey man, where my Dookie go? Like probably go up in the air and like evaporates and then turns into the cloud or some A Dookie cloud. And no, not the way you're probably thinking. Because as a Blue Devil, Mr. Langdon was anything but, you know, Dookie. He actually became one of the best scorers of all time for the program and was the program's leader for threes made until the pale whale JJ Reddick came along. He fit that 90s Duke and Coach Krzyzewski system to a T, maybe better than anyone not named Christian Leitner. Speaking of that system, many people wonder why so many Duke players become cheeks in the NBA. This stunt in Langdon's career is all you need to hear to answer that puzzling question. When we think of amateur basketball, especially college, we think of a place where you go and immediately you fall into a hierarchy where you know exactly who's above and below you. You know that the head coach is to be respected as your father for lack of better words. Any and everything he says goes and he's never to be challenged by anyone. The upperclassmen are next, unless they suck and a freshman or sophomore is better. In that case, the best players are next. There's the other coaches, then the guys on the end of the bench who rarely take their warm-ups off and can't wait for the game to end so they can go shake some beer pong table at some frat party. There's a system that's built around said star players that's very simple. Give them the ball where they like it, get out of the way, and unless you somehow become better than them over your four years, respect it or transfer. The coaching staff's job is to create opportunities for them. They picked this school because they knew that, and for all parties, it fits like a glove. They build a familiarity with the student body, and for their time there, they're the man on the campus, comfortable, fat, and happy. In most cases, said star player doesn't even have to be the best in the nation, best in the conference, or even the best on the team. They just have to fit the system, and they can look as good as they need to. The thing's wrong with that is this. It's a setup. It doesn't prepare you for the next level. You become so comfortable and used to being the man that you neglect the things that's going to make you excel on the next level. Because you're bringing in so much coin for that program and the ultimate fat and happy head coach, you're never told to adjust. Your broke jumper is never fixed. Those YMCA handles are never worked on. They don't let you know that you're out of position and should change your game a little because your changing your game changes the fit and it doesn't work for them. To me, that's what happened to Trajan Langdon in a nutshell. He was the ultimate system guy that could only score when a play was made for him and when he tried to make plays on his own in clutch situations against the nation's best, he literally fell flat on his face. Anyone can swim with the dolphins where it's shallow. When the sharks, as in players more athletic, 
younger every year, franchises where their jobs are all on the line by the year no matter the contract, best of the best, when those times arise, you begin to look lost as Langdon did against UConn and with the Cavaliers. He was too system of a player and never developed individual go-get-it skills, killer instinct where you have to scrap for yours, and a confidence that in a room full of vultures, you know how to move. Choosing Duke couldn't have went better for Langdon while he was there, not so much when he wasn't. Stunt number two, Fried. Another byproduct of choosing the right system only because it's the right system and not developing your game further is it sets you up for your deficiencies to be exposed on a national level where you aren't protected by a loyal fan base or a staple coach or a system. When you can't guard your assignment on a nightly basis, it'll be hard for you to find any sort of footing on a level where coaches and everyone else's jobs are on the line. They literally have employed staff that's keeping track of how bad you really are and how much you're either hurting or helping the team. Langdon has been a star since his high school days in Anchorage, Alaska, and all through his stellar career at Duke. He was dubbed the Alaskan Assassin because of how deadly his jumper was in college. If you let him get any sort of space off a pin down or flare screen, you were toast. He had the ultimate green light and developed the ultimate confidence in those situations. His problem always came on the defensive end. Langdon couldn't guard the ketchup at a Waffle House, a merry-go-round in a food court, a snowflake in July. Wait. Oh, this Anyway, you get what I'm saying. He just didn't have the defense to stop guys at the highest levels in the NBA. And when a coach's job is threatened by your lack on defense, after seeing you let Dana Barrows go by you for a fourth straight time, or you're definitely having a seat next to the rich weird guy that paid to sit on the bench and sniff players as they check in. Duke hid those facts, so when he was already in the fire in the NBA, it was too late. He also dealt with a knee injury that made him redshirt his true sophomore year, so that could have been the reason why he couldn't guard Julian Newman's sister. Either way, it hindered him getting the time on the floor he wanted and ultimately shortened his NBA career. No, defense doesn't win championships, but getting fried on defense will definitely shorten your time in the league. Stunt number three, six three. No, not June 3rd. 6'3", as in the height you probably don't want to be as a shooting guard in the 90s and early 2000s. It's his final and most obvious stunt. He was simply out of position. He never really had a chance to play the shooting guard in the league, all things previously mentioned considered. At that height, with his skills or lack thereof, in that era, who's he going to guard when his game is predicated solely on offense? Duke protected him through zone defenses and switch everythings, but at 6'3", you better have other skills like ball handling, passing, or athleticism, and you better be strong enough to take the beating night in and night out. Most of all, you better have the heart to face guys bigger than you nightly and get right back in their faces when challenged. Being on the smaller side for any position is an uphill battle, and for Trajan, it was one he just wasn't equipped to win. He needed some point guard skills to go with his shooting, defense to make up for his lack of height, and athleticism, killer instinct, and swagger to go with his all-American, or should I say, all-Alaskan marketability. At 6'3", and not possessing those things, it's not surprising that after three years, he was off to Europe to find a way. Credit to him, he did find that way and against that level of competition, he became a star and has lived a great life there. He did have the chance to return, but with him being a smart man, I think he understood his deficiencies and decided to continue the success he was having overseas. Since 2012, he's been working an NBA front office job and as of last year, the general manager for the New Orleans Pelicans and is doing quite the job for the franchise. All in all, I respect Trajan Langdon's game, also the decisions he's made, the man he's become, and for never making it ever about him, the ultimate team guy and seems like a great person. 
You may have laughed at some point through this video, but trust me, it was never to disrespect him in no way. Salute to him and all the success he's been having. I wish him nothing but the best. Continue doing a great job in your suit and tie. It's your boy JC Stunnergrow3.com and I'm out.